one of the five pledges that Prime Minister Rishi Sunak made in his speech on January 4, 2023 was to have inflation this year to ease the cost of living and give people financial security. But how realistic is this promise and what are the risks of trying to achieve it? Inflation is the rate at which the prices of goods and services increase over time. It affects the purchasing power of money and the cost of living for consumers. Inflation can be caused by various factors, such as supply shocks, demand pressures, currency depreciation, government spending, monetary policy and expectations. The UK has been experiencing high inflation since the end of 2022, reaching 5.4% in December, the highest level since 2011. This has been driven by a combination of factors, such as rising energy prices, global supply chain disruptions, labor shortages, Brexit-related trade frictions and pent-up demand after the pandemic. High inflation can have negative consequences for the economy and society, such as eroding the value of wages and savings, increasing the cost of borrowing, reducing business confidence and investment, creating uncertainty and social discontent. Therefore, it is understandable that Sunak wants to bring inflation down to a more manageable level. He has set a target of 2.7% by the end of 2023, which is still above the Bank of England's official target of 2%. However, achieving this goal may not be easy or desirable. First of all, some of the factors that are driving inflation are beyond the government's control or influence, such as global energy markets, supply chain bottlenecks and consumer behavior. These factors may persist for longer than expected or worsen due to unforeseen events, such as natural disasters, geopolitical tensions or new variants of COVID-19. Secondly, some of the measures that the government can take to reduce inflation may have negative side effects or trade-offs. For example, raising taxes or cutting spending may lower demand and inflation, but also slow down economic growth and hurt public services. Similarly, raising interest rates may curb inflation by making borrowing more expensive and saving more attractive, but also increase the cost of servicing the national debt and dampen investment and consumption. Thirdly, some of the benefits of inflation may be overlooked or underestimated. For example, inflation can help reduce the real value of debt and make it easier to repay over time. Inflation can also stimulate economic activity by encouraging spending and investment before prices rise further. Inflation can also boost competitiveness by making exports cheaper and imports more expensive. Therefore, Sunak's pledge to have inflation this year could backfire and cause more economic instability and hardship for the public. It could fail to achieve its target due to external shocks or policy mistakes. It could also harm growth, employment, public services and social welfare by imposing excessive austerity or monetary tightening. It could also miss out on some opportunities that moderate inflation can offer for debt reduction, economic stimulus and competitiveness enhancement. In conclusion, Sunak's pledge to have inflation this year is not only ambitious but also risky. It may not be feasible or desirable given the complex and uncertain causes and consequences of inflation. It may also be counterproductive or unnecessary if inflation proves to be transitory or beneficial in some ways. Instead of focusing on a single numerical target, Sunak should adopt a more flexible and balanced approach that takes into account the multiple dimensions and dynamics of inflation and its impact on the economy and society. One of Rishi Sunak's five pledges as Prime Minister is to grow the economy, creating better paid jobs and opportunity right across the country. But how realistic is this goal, and how could it be undermined by his own policies of cutting public spending and raising taxes? According to the Office for Budget Responsibility OBR, the UK economy is expected to grow by 1.6% in 2023, down from 4.1% in 2022. This is partly due to the impact of Brexit, which has reduced trade and investment with the EU, and partly due to the end of the furlough scheme, which has increased unemployment and reduced consumer spending. But Sunak's own fiscal plans could also hamper economic growth, according to some economists and analysts. In his autumn budget last year, 
Sunak announced a series of spending cuts and tax rises that will reduce the size of the state to its lowest level since the 1960s. He also froze public sector pay for most workers, cut universal credit by £20 a week, and scrapped the triple lock on pensions. These measures are intended to reduce the budget deficit, which ballooned during the pandemic, and to lower the national debt, which is another one of Sunak's pledges. But they could also have negative consequences for the economy, by reducing aggregate demand, lowering living standards, and widening inequality. For example, cutting universal credit will push 300,000 more people into poverty, according to the Joseph Rountree Foundation. Freezing public sector pay will reduce the purchasing power of millions of workers, who are already struggling with rising inflation and energy bills. And scrapping the triple lock on pensions will erode the incomes of older people, who tend to spend more of their money in the local economy. Moreover, raising taxes on businesses and workers could discourage investment and innovation, which are essential for long-term growth and productivity. Sunak has increased corporation tax from 19% to 25%, introduced a new health and social care levy of 1.25%, and frozen income tax thresholds, which will drag more people into higher tax brackets. These tax rises will affect not only the private sector, but also the public sector, which relies on tax revenues to fund vital services such as health, education, and infrastructure. By cutting public spending and raising taxes, Sunak is risking a vicious cycle of low growth, low revenues, and low investment. This could undermine his pledge to grow the economy and create better paid jobs and opportunity right across the country. Instead of boosting growth, he could be stifling it. Instead of spreading prosperity, he could be deepening austerity. And instead of delivering on his promises, he could be leading the country to disaster. In this section, we will examine how Sunak's pledge to stop the boats could violate international law and human rights, and fail to address the root causes of migration.